Welcome to the deep learning uh, with uh, Python workshops. We're welcome. We're very happy that you could join us. We're going to be doing some quick brief introductions of the participants for uh, the very first uh, workshop here. Uh, be sure to look below for the uh, descriptions of the links to all the relevant materials. Uh, Professor Eberl, Marcus, can I call on you uh, to introduce yourself next? Absolutely. So yes, I'm Marcus Eberl. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. I work as an archaeologist specifically with soil samples. And I'm here with a team who wants to identify lithic microdebitage based on images. So this is the debris produced by ancient stone nappers, and we want to identify them in soil samples. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis. Hi, I'm Phyllis Johnson. I'm a PhD candidate and archaeologist in the anthropology department. And I'll be working with Marcus Eberl on the uh, project to distinguish lithic microdebitage from soil and soil samples. Excellent. Sam. Uh, hi, I'm Sam. I am a rising second year undergraduate student, and I am here as a data science for social good fellow. Excellent. Dennis. Hi, I'm Dennis. I'm a health policy PhD student and part of the Data Science for Social Good program as well. Excellent. Aswapnita. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Swapnita. I am a senior scientist in biological sciences at Vanderbilt. And few of the projects we have in mind are using the tissue specific data for various markers that are expressed as well as RNA that are expressed and try to learn from these data that are available. Fantastic. Mubarak. Hi, I'm Mubarak. Um, an incoming graduate student at Vanderbilt University Data Science Institute. This summer I'll be working with um, Dr. Gauss Spencer Morris on the pattern recognition of uh, on a pattern recognition project to recognize different portions of the patterns of mocha pots. Excellent, very very good. Uh, Giles, I'll I'll go to you next. All right, yeah, that's uh, Giles Spencer I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow in the, the DSI as well as the anthropology department. I'm an archaeologist as well. Uh, working with the uh, consideration of moche ceramic iconography, very complicated scenes, uh, and looking at the relationship between entire vessels and individual sherds that are found in excavation to relate individual sherds to known samples. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and again, reminder, if you haven't already, please go ahead and put a short description of projects in the, the, the link in the chat. Uh, Yu Shen. Hi, I'm Yu Chen, and I'm a second year graduate student at Vanderbilt University in the Data Science Institute. And I'm now working on a project with Giles and Mubarak. Thank you. Great. Uh, Joseph. <coughs> My name is Joseph. I'm an undergraduate student. Uh, I'm majoring in uh, math and philosophy, and I'm just here to uh, learn and participate in projects. Excellent. Amy. Hi, uh, my name is Amy. I'm also an undergraduate, but I'm double majoring in English and Anthropology, and I'm going to be a part of Dr. Uh, Eberl's archaeological study. Fantastic. And Mickey. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Mickey Kassad. I'm the executive director of Vanderbilt's um, Digital Humanities Center. And I'm, uh, I'm here because I would really like to see more work being done at Vanderbilt at this intersection of data science and humanities research. So I'm here to learn um, more myself and learn more about how I can support faculty who are doing these projects. Thank you, Dr. Kassad. Jordan. Hi, uh, my name is Jordan. I'm a rising third year PhD student uh, studying computational models of human memory, and I'm looking to relate theories of memory, particularly of uh, stories, uh, to uh, models and um, tools, and uh, in the, I guess, in the sphere that we're working in right now. Yeah. Excellent. Vishal. Hi, I'm Vishal. I'm a undergraduate student studying biomedical engineering. I'm just here to learn more about. Uh, machine learning in biomedicine. Thank you. Excellent. 
Yuhan. Hi, my name is Yuhan. I'm also undergraduate, rising senior. I'm just here to learn and participate. I'm an econ major. Very good. Tyler. Hi, I'm Tyler. I'm an undergraduate rising sophomore, and I'll be working with Professor Ebro for the project with application to archaeology. Excellent. Francisco. Hi, uh, my name is Francisco Meyer. I am a PhD candidate in clinical psychology. I do most of my work with neuroimaging, uh, but I'm here to just kind of learn and get a first exposure to Python and uh, learning and data science. So I'm going to be participating in projects. Excellent. Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm part of the microdepotage and soil sample project with Dr. Ebril and Phyllis Johnson. And I'm a graduate student. Very, very good. Spencer. Good morning. I'm a law student. I'm here on, on behalf of Professor Fitzpatrick, who's doing uh, class action research. And yeah, just here to learn. Excellent. Davis. Hi, uh, I'm Davis Glenn. I'm a undergraduate rising junior and I study math and physics. And I'm just here to learn more and hopefully uh, find a project to work on. Fantastic. Uh, Akash, Akash, I'm sorry, Akash. Hello, uh, my name is Akash C. McCurdy. Uh, I'm a upcoming sophomore studying computer science. Just here to learn and hopefully be a part of a project. Thank you. And uh, Peter, Dr. Lewis. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Biomedical Informatics. I'm doing a computer vision project uh, looking to train a model to recognize non small cell lung cancer, histological subtypes, as well as the presence of uh, driver mutations of cancer. Excellent. Sunny. Hi, my name is Sunny. I'm a rising uh, junior majoring in math, computer science, and econ. Uh, I'm here as a data science for social good program fellow. Excellent. And uh, Mafe? Uh, hi, I'm a computational biologist and a PhD candidate in cancer biology. And I'm here as, also as a data science for good fellow. Lee. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm a master's student at DSI Ryzen second year. I want to learn how to apply deep learning to natural language process and text analysis. Fantastic. Julia. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Lu. Uh, I'm an undergrad studying math and psychology minor in data science and i'm here to learn more about python and nlp fantastic and chriselle hi everybody i'm chriselle soros i'm a second year graduate student in the physics and astronomy department um, and i'm interested of maybe learning a new way to look at solar images and how to classify solar flares and i'm here also to learn about new tools Excellent. Very good. Shalini. Yes. Uh, good morning. I am from the community. I have done some NLP work uh, on my class uh, to last semester. Uh, but yeah, here to learn, but very interested in the intersection of this and climate solutions. Excellent. Joel. Hi. Um, I'm a first year undergrad, and I'm going to joining Dr. Picard's lab next year. And this lab focused on science scientific communication as, as well as news report during pandemics. So that's why I'm here. Excellent, very, very good. Hunter. Hi, I am a uh, at the Owens School in uh, the accounting group and I am hoping uh, to use this knowledge for some data analysis on congressional testimony by chief executive officers and on looking at some analyst reports. Fantastic, very, very good. And uh, Danny, uh, uh, I know you, you, you just joined, we're just doing quick introductions of our name, uh, the project that we're, uh, our, our sort of uh, affiliation and the, the, the project that we're interested in. 
Yes, hi. Um, so I'm uh, Danny Picard. I'm a senior lecturer in medicine, health, and society. And the project that I'm working on is looking at um, both journal, scientific journal articles from nature and science and looking at how they are using historical comparisons to other epidemics when they're writing about COVID um, research. Excellent. Now we, we had a little bit of juggling of the images. Is there anybody, raise your hand if, uh, if I did not call on you. All right, it looks like we got everybody. So one thing that I'm struck by is the wide variety of, of applications of, uh, that, that people are, are, are considering. And one thing that I think is, is really quite interesting is that this would not be unusual that machine learning could be used to address all of these kinds of, of issues. It's not even surprising that deep learning can be used to address all these kinds of different projects. But what is unusual is that a particular kind of deep learning architecture, in particular transformers, can be used. So one particular type of architecture can be used to address all of these, ranging from text to analysis of sequences to analysis of uh, images. Uh, and we didn't have anybody doing sound, but you can use this for sound too. So this is a very powerful general technique, which is relatively new. Its application outside of the area of natural language processing is also newer, uh, but it is showing tremendous, tremendous project uh, 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 promise. So uh, now that we've had some, uh, some introductions, let's take a look at what we're gonna be doing today uh, and, uh, and also what we aim to do for the, uh, for the rest of the week. So, uh, We've done introductions. I'm going to be giving you an introduction to deep learning. Uh, some of you have, may have seen a presentation that I did earlier in the year on, on deep learning. That's going to constitute the first little part of this, but then we're going to quickly go into some new material as well. I'm going to give you an introduction to transformer models that we're going to be talking about in depth uh, for the rest of this workshop. We're going to be talking about the transformer processing life cycle. It's a little bit different uh, than um, uh, than other uh, uh, processing uh, of cycles that you have in machine learning and, and, uh, uh, and deep learning. Then I'm going to be introducing you to uh, a collection of models and code and approaches called Hugging Face, which has really um, changed the way uh, not only that we work with and we collaborate on transformer models, but it's had a, a huge impact on others as well and how we think about how we might collaborate in the future on these deep learning models. I'm going to be introducing uh, a very powerful technique which is not limited to, to hugging face or to, to this type of, of problem, but the idea of pipelines. Uh, pipelines uh, is a very powerful way, especially in data science, to handle what otherwise would be complex code that is kind of template-like, tem template but boiling it down to something which is accessible to pretty much everyone who has uh, a, a good handle on, on, on programming. And uh, it, it's the difference between being able to apply these models after six months of study and being able to apply these models after a few days of study. Doesn't mean that you can do everything. You can still absolutely make mistakes but at least you get to your first model and you can begin to, uh, to iterate in days instead of months. We're gonna have a breakout room. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the applications of pipelines. I'm gonna be asking you to think about uh, projects that you have and other ideas that you might have of, of some applications of these pipelines that we're gonna be discussing. Then we're gonna do a deeper dive into transformers. So in four days, we do not have time to get all the way into the theory of what's actually happening. But what I can do is to give you uh, an idea, a good sense of what's happening and, and the, the basics of what are, what are happening behind the scenes. Uh, and then we'll have resources that we can point you to so you can go deeper uh, as time permits. We're gonna be talking about an important uh, distinction between feature extraction and fine tuning. And we'll talk about that, but that's gonna be an important distinction about the kind of how you're using these tools. We're gonna to have a final breakout room uh, and what we're gonna be talking about, when do you need fine tuning? So that is what is on tap. Questions, actually, questions. Any questions before we get started? All right. 
day two in general is going to be uh, uh, getting into code. It's very high level pipeline code, but you'll actually be trying out models and doing inferencing of models. Uh, th uh, day three is we're going to be going uh, yeah, in depth on, on coding. And day four, we're going to be talking about training models. And we're also going to actually be showing some of the work that we've been doing over the past week. So my request to you is, of course, participate, speak up, put things in chat, make sure that you're actually engaged and you're trying out all the code as we're trying it. And also after the workshops, after each evening, go ahead and do some additional work, especially day two and day three, give it a shot to take the first step with your particular projects. For some of you, this is gonna be easier than others. For the images, for example, the pipelines are not quite as uh, full blown. So I'm not too sure if we can sort of do the first pass model or not. We'll find out. But for others, especially those doing natural language processing, by, Friday, by, by Thursday, I'm sorry, that's the last day. By Thursday, uh, day four, uh, you actually could very well likely have your first pass of your model. Uh, and I would suggest if you are working on something where you don't have your data yet, or if uh, you can't quite figure out how to do the images, maybe you wanna go ahead and pick another data set just to, to try out so you can make sure that you can do the pipelines. But the idea is that by, the, uh, by Thursday, we're able to share some of what we've done. So any questions about the week? All right. Then let's go ahead and put this in a little bit of context here. So this is how I, I like to think about uh, machine learning versus a, a deep learning and, and over, over the history. Um, and uh, the funny thing is, at, at various times, all of these different things were called AI. So now it tends to be deep learning, which, got, which gets called AI, uh, artificial intelligence. But what's happened over time is that uh, you know early uh, early on the very first you know in the fifties you had very defined solutions to very defined problems, and then uh, uh, with the neural nets you started to be able to solve more general kinds of problems, but you couldn't go terribly terribly far. Then we had the area of machine era of machine learning, where if you had a defined problem with a simple outcome, by simple I mean you know, yes or no, or categories, or a number, then you could use machine learning to take complex structured data to come up with a simple answer. So very powerful. I'm, I'm, I'm not throwing any shade. You know, these are very powerful techniques, but they required structured data, and they require a structured, simple kind of output. And now you have deep learning. In deep learning, things changed quite a bit. Uh, now you can have complex input, image, text, sounds, uh, and you can uh, now come up with complex uh, outputs. So um, let's go and take a look and see what that, that looks like. Uh, in the brief history, a brief history of deep learning, revolution really started with convolutional neural nets. And then we had recurrent neural nets. The recurrent neural nets, uh, convolutional neural nets could take images. Recurrent neural nets could take signals over time. Recurrent neural nets were hard because uh, they were very tough to parallelize. They could only, they required all of the signals to be in sequence. It could only learn in sequence. And so training them would take a long, long time and they were a bit limited by that. And then you had transformers. Transformers was able to parallelize that. And so you didn't have to have things just fed in order uh, it could actually learn much more easily in parallel. It combined a number of different powerful ideas. And now you're finding applications of transformers in things that used to be the sole domain of convolutional neural nets. So transformers turns out to be a very powerful general learner. So let me describe a little bit of what I, what I mean. So when I say complex output, this is one example of complex output. Uh, you can have a, uh, a deep learning solution that does image segmentation and tagging, and it can return an image with everything segmented that it sees as individual objects and can actually do tagging on that as well. So here you have identify, an, an identification of cars, people, uh, roadways, walkways, bicycles, pylons, signs, text, 
deep learning can accomplish uh, this, this, uh, this task because instead of depending on uh, everything being labeled and everything being structured as you need for machine learning uh, and statistical learning, instead, it learns its own features. It can learn its own features uh, over time and it can learn complex relationships over time. So the downside of this is that these are really compute intensive. So to train something up from the ground up uh, to get to this level of performance requires millions of dollars of compute. So the other groundbreaking uh, progress, the groundbreaking uh, change was the idea that instead of training all models from the ground up, you would pre-train models. So you take models and you train them on image sets, for example, uh, that this was based on, image sets of millions of images that are tagged. And then over time, it can learn and actually begin to uh, develop uh, an understanding of visual scenes. Now you can take that pre-trained model and apply it to a different task. So it's kind of akin to pre-training a model. And so it already has developed its own V1 visual cortex. And then you can apply that problem to another area. So you don't have to do all that training, but now you can actually take this, for example, and, and say, okay, now I want to identify, I want, you know, vans, utility vans. So I want to, I want to be able to identify this thing. Well, that's going to be a lot simpler when you're already up at this level where you can have uh, something which already knows what a vehicle is. So here's another example of complex input. So in this case, it just happens to be text, but this is also complex input. In some ways, this is a lot more complex than that scene that we saw before, because now we're not just trying to separate out the different parts of the scene. Now we have concepts uh, and, and we have language, we have concepts, uh, we have a lot going on here. I take, take a moment and just sort of read this and, and think about uh, all the concepts that are there. I'm going to give you just about 60 seconds to read this. All right, let me ask you, what are some of the concepts that you saw in there? Yeah, we have distance, absolutely. So you have the concept of distance, uh, different translations, languages, area, absolutely. Species, biology, absolutely. Think about the, the rich detail that's, that's carried in that, in that language. So let's go, and, let's go into a task around this. I'm gonna ask you how many square kilometers of rainforest is covered in the basin? And I'm sorry, but your time is up. Now, you had plenty of time to read it. So let me ask you, can you tell me how many square kilometers of rainforest is covered in the basin? I'll give you another moment. Let's go ahead and see if we can submit this to a transformer model. So all we're doing, we didn't do any sort of additional training. We're taking this pre-trained model we're giving it this text and we're asking it this question. It's called one shot. One shot question answering, no pre-training. So the answer that it comes up with is 5,500,000. Hmm. Other people thought it was 7 million. Ah, I could see where you could make the mistake. Basin the basin encompasses. 7 million, but I asked how many square kilometers of the rainforest is covered in the basin? And that answer is 5.5 million. So in, in my mind, pretty remarkable that we have a natural language processing uh, solution uh, that, can, that can do this. So 
let's talk a little bit about how learning occurs in general uh, in these. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about transformers in particular. So before we do that, what questions do you have? All right, let's talk about training. So deep learning models work completely differently than other machine learning models. Uh, instead of uh, trying to do a regression or trying to find uh, to fit trees, you can almost think of this as much more akin to many logistic regression models stacked on top of one another. But what's really happening is that we are having some input here and then we're having output here so here's a, a basic uh, 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 model that uh, is meant to do uh, to solve MNIST which is uh, the problem of, of identifying which character which which number is being written in, in a handwritten uh, uh, a handwritten letter and, and identifying what the number is and you have an in by in image and you actually just take all the pixels and you just spread them all out. That becomes your 781. What is the square root of 781? Because I forget what, what size these images are. Somebody tell me what the square root of 7, 781 is. So what's happening is that we're putting all of these pixels in and we're asking the network to learn. This is how we do it. So the data goes in. So the data goes in and this is the forward sweep. And then what happens is each of these pixels has a different length. So you can think of this as being grayscale. So it has a scale between zero and uh, uh, let's say, say 256. So it has a particular weight and it's gonna activate this node right here, this hidden, called hidden node because it's not on the outside. It's not on the beginning, it's not on the outside. 28 by 28, thank you, Preston. Um, so uh, this node is activated. Now this has random connections to these other nodes. And so you're pretty much getting garbage coming in. But then this is where the magic happens. So you have feed forward, and then you're gonna take all the errors that you had and you're gonna propagate those back. And it's along the lines of, oh, you answered an incorrect number that was not the correct answer. Therefore, all the weights that gave me that incorrect answer, I'm going to move those down. I'm going to move away from the weights that gave me the correct, the incorrect data. And uh, the idea there is that you figure out what the what the gradient is. We're not going to go too much detail right now, but you're figuring out what direction you need to step in order to make to, to lower your error. And then that you take a step back. So you are doing that to this first layer here, and then you're doing the same thing by taking it further back until you actually go all the way back here. So all these weights are adjusted, hopefully in the direction of something that should give you a more correct answer the next time. So very compute intensive. There are a lot of matrix and vector multiplies that go on going forward and going back. But the idea is that over time, you can get better and better performance. And that's the name of the game for all of these deep learning solutions is to iteratively get closer and closer to better weights that give you better answers. So when I talk about a deep learning solution learning, or about concepts being encoded, those concepts are actually being encoded right here in those weights. So it is the weights between the nodes that is capturing the information uh, that's, uh, 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 that, that can help it give uh, the right answer. So we'll watch it one more time. Forward and then back propagation. Intense compute, that's why this in compute uh, is usually done on GPUs, graphical processing units. They're on usually on discrete video cards. Um, 
often used for gaming, often used for mining Bitcoin, which is why there's a shortage right now of GPUs, because people are using them to, to, to mine uh, digital currencies. Uh, but that type of matrix multiplication and vector multiplication is perfect uh, for this type of math that we're doing here. So you want more and more compute, as much compute as you can get. And Peter asks, so this is true for all models, whether CNN, transformers, or RNN? Yes. This idea of feed forward and then the back propagation fixing those errors. Uh, it looks a little bit different uh, depending on the particular architecture that you have. You always have that idea of moving those weights incrementally in the proper direction to get lower and lower error uh, over time. Great question. Other questions? All right. So I keep on waving my hands and saying, ah, but transformers look a little bit different. Well, here's, here's a transformer model. This one is going to be a BERT. So what's different here? Well, let's take, let's take this piece by piece. The first thing is, now you have these things called token encodings and token embeddings. Think about what we had here. We had an image, and all we did was we take the we took the image, we raveled it, we we you know we unraveled it. So we took a twenty-eight by twenty-eight, turned it into a seven hundred eighty. Oh, that was seven hundred eighty-four, not seven hundred eighty-one. That's why that square root didn't come out right. So it's seven eighty-four um, uh, long. Right, but that's kind of natural. It's kind of like, or if it's a grayscale image, all of those are already zero to two fifty six. That already makes sense. What are you going to do with uh, with text? And text is not numbers. Well, what you have to do is you have to do tokens. So you're going to be taking words, or actually sub parts of words, subwords, and you're going to be identifying those with integers. You're just going to count them. So a couple of things important here. That means that your token encoding is going to be really intimately tied to what you trained on. And the way you do particular encoding is going to be is going to have to be intimately tied to the model that you have. So these two things are go together, the encoding that you use and the model that you're training. We'll get a little bit more in depth to the, to the encoding, but know that roughly what's happening is that words, or actually parts of words, are being identified with numbers. Now what's meant by token embeddings? Well, actually a couple of things are, are going on here. So you're taking the token encodings and you're stacking them up for a certain span of words. So think of it along these lines. Um, if uh, I have the word cat, and uh, I'm gonna give the cat, word cat, the number seven. Cats are seven. So now I have a certain span of words, let's say about a, you know, let's say a couple of hundred words. And what I want to do is to note whether or not the word cat appeared in the span of, of words. One way to encode that is that I simply take a vector. I have a vector that starts at zero and goes all the way to the last number that I have for that last word. So let's say it's a thousand, 10,000. Let's say a thousand, all right? So all the words have a thousand word vocabulary. Cat happens to be number seven. If I want to do an embedding, and if I want to say, hey, in this other span of words that I had, the word cat did appear, then what I'm going to do is in this long vector, I'm going to put a one in the seventh position. And what that means is at some point, the word cat appeared in this span of words. Then I'll say that I have dog. Let's say dog is number eight because of course cats are higher than dogs. Actually, I'm a dog person, but I didn't want to offend anybody. So let's say the dog is eight. Wonderful. Now there's going to be a one in the eight spot. So 
to whatever this is, I know, I don't know where the other ones are because I don't know what the other words are yet, but I have zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, right? So I have two ones, meaning that cat and dog both appeared in that. That is that token embedding, which I'm now going to be feeding to this model. So that's what that encoding looks like. So in actuality, our first problem is figuring out what our encoding is going to be and what it's going to look like and what rules we're going to follow for the encoding. Okay. Now, the next thing is that BERT encoder stack. What that encoder stack is doing is essentially finding the relationships and finding which parts, which words and which parts of words were the most important, the most salient, the ones that we should be attending to, where attention should go in all the words that I have just given it. And then it creates this higher level embedding of this information. So one of the cool things that came out of, of work about, it's almost, almost 10 years ago now, called Word to Vec, we took this original idea of embedding words in spaces, but they did it in such a way where the word sort of went someplace where it had meaning, it had a semantic space. So a very different kind of encoding of words, but the idea that you're gonna be placing these in a space where words that are similar are close by. And you could do cool things with these kinds of embeddings. You could take queen, for example, and you could do math on these. So you can take the vector which stood for queen and, sub and subtract from it the concept for man, a, a queen and subtract the concept for, for woman and then add the concept of man. And then that would put you in someplace close to king. So semantic spaces where you could do this, this kind of math on concepts. That's what's happening in BERT. So it's actually figuring out the embeddings. It's BERT is learning what those high level represent, representations are. And it's doing that in uh, an increasingly deep kind of manner. That's what BERT is learning. And what it ends up with is it produces, uh, again, those hidden states. Remember, anybody remember why we call them hidden? Why are nodes, why were nodes in the previous one called hidden? And you can unmute and speak, or you can put it into chat. So I'll, I'll remind you of exactly where this was. We called, whoops, I went way past it. We called these middle parts hidden. Why was that? You, so Peter, that's, that's actually sort of a downstream effect, absolutely. Uh, if I point to this right here, is this one of the first layers? No, this is the first layer. Is it one of the last layers? No. If I want to be able to visually inspect, Peter, you're absolutely right. I can see exactly what these values are, and I can see what these values are. It is hidden because it is not an input layer or an output layer. That's all that's meant. So it's not an input layer or an output layer directly, so it's called hidden. So you have what's called hidden states. So it takes everything that has been processing before, hello, Mark, uh, and uh, activates a particular state. So now you have a brand new representation of the text that went in. And now what's happening is you have hidden states which represents the meaning of what was covered in that text or covered in that input. So that's the hidden state. And this is a conceptual representation of what was given to BERT. This, is, this might be useful on its own, but often what's done, say, in a classification model is you use those hidden states to do the next thing. So you might want to actually look to see whether something is discussing pets 
or not. And in that case, you can take a look at the hidden states and it's much easier to train on that than it is on, on the low level sub word features that we had early. So it gives you really useful high level features that you can learn off of, and then you can make predictions. So in this setting, we're using this entire token encodings, token embedding, BERT encoder stack and hidden state just to do our feature engineering for us. It's solving that first part of the problem where we have complex input and giving it to us in a high level, more simplified way that we can do traditional machine learning on it. And that's an absolutely acceptable use of uh, one type of use of these types of models. All right. So we're going to get more into this in just a, in just a moment. But let's talk and let's go back to that idea that what's happening here is that it's learning in that it's learning concepts. So I have another challenge for you. This is from Zora Neale Hurston, their eyes were watching God. Uh, and actually I came up with this example, uh, 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 Mickey, you might uh, appreciate this, uh, uh, sitting on the O'Galley River, which was Zora Neale Hurston's favorite place. Um, and it occurred to me, boy, I really ought to use an example of Zora Neale Hurston. So tell me what you think this next word is. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on blank. Go ahead and type in the uh, speak or, 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 or type in there. Boy, a bunch of people are going right to the to the, the top dollar. So, uh, okay, thank you, Amy, yeah. So we could say, we could say deck. Uh, if I'm even clunkier, I could say, ships at a different distance have every man's wish on the ship. Is, is that, first of all, you want to tell me, is that technically cor correct? Yeah, so that one kind of works, right? Which is better? Every man's wish on the ship or every man's wish uh, on deck? Which, which reads better? Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Sam, why is deck better than on the ship? I, and you can un unmute. It's just more natural sounding and more specific. Yeah, okay. So they both work with the language. So we already established that they both work, meaning that the language is correct, but the deck sounds better. It's clunky when you repeat words, right? You, you, how many people do that in emails? Quick thumbs up. You, you write an email, you think it's great, and you realize that you reuse the same word like three times in one sentence. I know, we're human and we do that and we hate it. And so we go back and we edit it, right? Because that doesn't sound as good, all right? Uh, someone else, why is on board better than on deck? Mickey, can I can I can I impose on you to sort of give your thought? I guess to me, on board sounds more poetic. Um, it it's sort of ends with a, um, a, a rounder kind of sound. Um, I don't know. What does anybody else think? Yeah. And Giles, you mentioned turn of phrase. It's sort of a traditional component of you know, something is on board or are you on board? Mm -hmm. Sort of all these different meanings with, with, with on exactly. Uh, Peter, and you, you say sort of, you know, more more frequently is could, could be that um and and mickey and i also agree that that it's that it's more poetic on board means more than just on the deck that means you're standing on the deck this means on board somewhere on the ship it carries along with it not necessarily just directly on the ship poetic on deck literally on the top perfect danny right on board hidden below deck or right on the surface fantastic mark it fills up the space of the ship absolutely well, you will not be surprised at all. And I, I love those. 
As Orniel Orston chose, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. Yes. So these deep learning networks first learn what words are technically correct. They have to be able to learn the language. And that's enough of a lift, right? These, these, these models are being trained in exactly this way. Uh, a, a variety of these models are trained in exactly this way. Given a text, mask the last word, and guess what that word is. And at first, it's random, and it's guessing duck. And then you say, duck was not correct, wrong answer. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to correct all those weights going back because it was not right. And then it tries again. And then it goes back and then it tries again. You can imagine that this is an extremely large number of parameters. As a matter of fact, the larger of these, largest of these, these are billions of different weights that you're changing, billions. So this is to compute this takes the energy of a small city for several weeks to compute and to get it to the point where it can get to the point of at least getting the language right. Oh on the ship, on deck being correct. So those deeper layers begin to learn the language and it actually forms concepts and so it gets language right. In these types of models, these are called, um, they're called, uh, I think they're called causal, I want to look that up, simply because you, you train on everything before and you've got to guess that last word. Other models are, are just called mask and they get, just a word mask and they get to look before and after. And it turns out these models are, are when they're trained in these two different ways are, are good at two different kinds of, of tasks, of course. Uh, these types of models trained in this way are really good at generating text. So once you, once you put in wish on board, now just run it again, guess the next word. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. Next word. Uh, so, over extensive training and retraining, it learns the language. Then it begins to learn that usually writers don't repeat themselves. So maybe ships at a distance have, distance have every man's war, wish on the ship isn't good. I don't see that that often. So I'm gonna choose deck over ship. Now I've learned that. And then you get to the point where you start learning uh, poetic. You start learning uh, those higher, higher level concepts of what kind of writing goes, what kind of word would complete this kind and style of writing. So that's what these types of models uh, are capable of. Anybody know where the training material for these models comes from? Guess where these training materials come from? Yep, Wikipedia, Google, yep, Google Books, the whole internet, all of those are correct. So because you're using self-supervised, right? You, you didn't require tagging. You didn't have to train on a bunch of images. Instead, what you did was you said, I'm gonna block out this word. Guess what the word is? So you have all this training material now. It's called self-supervised learning. So yes, the entire, the entire, uh, internet. Can you think of any issues that might come up because you are using text that you find on the internet in how these things learn and what these things learn? And feel free to, to unmute if you don't want to type all that out. Could there be like a um, unequal, like say you're trying to fill in the blanks of like a really old text, but like a lot of like internet language is probably like heavily skewed to like modern like vernacular. Uh, absolutely. So that that's oh boy, you you went deep very quickly, Amy. So yes, that's right. It's learning modern lingo, right? and even if you're training on other languages, it's still more modern lingo. And so you have the issue of historical text maybe meaning needing additional training. Great, great call. Ooh, Davis. People could be mean if it's social media or okay or too professional. But yeah, that, so you have mean, not fully representative for some periods, yes. Uh, and yes, it can also learn personal information, that's true. 
Uh, Wikipedia is different from poetry and, and, and others texts and, and Reddit speak. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Do you think, oh, and yes, Mark, you're absolutely right. You have bad editions, right? So poor spelling and mistakes and, and multiple editions of those. Would you say that the internet is a place to just by and large free of bias, racist, sexist language? It's pretty much, no, it's pretty much okay. Yeah, no, right. And this is what it's learning on. And so this is what you get. You ask for automatic tags to be generated based on images. Take a look what's shown with the man. So both of these are obviously like Congress people or government folks, someone kind of like that. I mean, um, what do you get on the left? Public speaking, speech, suit, business, business person. What do you get on the right? Smile, spokesperson, black hair, hairstyle. So when people comment on images, when they generate the text that is, that is training these models, this is what's being encoded in those deeper and deeper levels. So that's, uh, we, we, we won't go too much into this, but there's a great article uh, which we link to uh, in the resources. It's incredibly important to remember that for these la large language models, so-called because they've learned on a large corpus of language, it is absorbing the concepts and ideas that are in there. So we don't get things for free. You have to be on the lookout and assess every solution that you come up with for the biases which are inherent in the text on which it was trained. There's no such thing as a bias-free algorithm because it's learning on the data. If the data is the source code. And if there is bias or issues in the, da in the data of which these models have been, on which these models have been trained, it will appear there. So. Uh, do take a look. There's a great article uh, on, that involves uh, uh, a great concept called the stochastic parrot uh, that, uh, that I would suggest you take a look at uh, by uh, Timnit uh, uh, Gebru and, uh, and, uh, and others. Mark asks, can that be anticipated in the training? Weight different sources differently? Possibly. You can at least ameliorate the issue. There's a new international effort, actually, which has just started up that Hugging Faces is helping sponsor to create a, a new completely open source version of these models, because these models, think about how much compute it took to create these, millions of dollars of compute. So who, who created them? Google, Facebook are the, are the two preeminent models right now. NVIDIA came up with, with uh, another model as well. Uh, but these are the large companies which are which provide these. But um, now, international effort being supported by a, a French supercomputing center uh, on creating more curated uh, text on which these would be trained, not labeled, but simply uh, taking that into account uh, for representation. Excellent. All right. So we're going to be taking a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about Hugging Face. And yes, Hugging Face is actually named uh, uh, the Hugging Face icon. They do use the word huggingface.co. That's, that's, uh, that's the URL. But in actuality, the company is called Hugging Face Emoticon. Uh, how many of you remember when Prince, the artist Prince, had the uh, falling out with his record company and he changed his name? to an image and did not use the word prince. Uh, a couple of people remember that. Oh yeah, I kind of think of that like this. Uh, so it's called Hugging Face and we're gonna be getting into that in the second half uh, of our discussion. Let's go and take a uh, five minute break so we'll get back together at 11.06 and we'll continue our conversation. Sound good? Excellent. See you all at 11.06. Uh, Jesse, uh, go ahead and pause the recording so we don't get the five minute break. For the... Thank you. Welcome back. Let's think a little bit more about, uh, about transformer models. And let's think about the context in which this, this, this work needs to be done. We're starting here with token encodings. 
what comes before the token encodings? What are we starting with at the very, very beginning? Getting the data? Yeah, yeah, you have the raw data, exactly. So you need to have the text or the images or the sound. You need to have the data. Excellent. Then you can do the encodings. Then you can do the actual modeling part, part of uh, BERT. Then you can do the additional training on that classification model. Then you have predictions. Then what comes after? What do you compare those predictions to? Yeah, the ground truth. You go back to the data, right? So in actuality, that larger, that larger uh, process is you got to get your data set. So you've got to load and process your data set. Uh, then you need to tokenize your input text. Because remember, it can't work with words. It has to work with uh, integers that stand in for words or even sub words. Then you do that modeling part. And really, this, this, this is for whether you're going to be doing training or inferencing, uh, any of those. If you all you're doing is you're just running it to get an answer, you still need to have that transformer part. Um, if you're doing training, then uh, what's going to be happening is this is going to be a lot more intense because we're going to have back propagation going on here, right? But it, essentially, it's the same. And then finally, you need to get back to your data sets. You need to load your metrics. You need to evaluate your models against the ground truth. So this is, this is the traditional transformer work flow here. This is, this is what this looks like. And actually, there, there are a number of different steps that need to go on uh, with this. And uh, it can be a little bit uh, daunting to remember all the different things that have to do with loading. And then remember, you have to have the tokenizer. Can you use any old tokenizer with any old transformer model? Can you mix and match? Yes or no? <clears throat> We have a no. Why do you think no, Jesse? And you can just unmute. Yeah, I mean, I just I think that there's too many differences. I mean, even if we just see um, just the differences in text, I'll just stick with text for this, right? That if you think about the difference between text of, you know, a novel versus poetry versus a training manual versus social media versus advertising, right? I mean, like different tokens are going to mean different things. I know I work yes. in finance. There's been a lot of work about how the same word can mean a different thing in finance than it can somewhere else, right? Like liquidity, the word liquidity means something in finance, but it means something different in chemistry, for instance, right? So Absolutely. You, need, you, need, you need more context. So what was seven in the very first toy model we were talking about? What was seven? Are you still talking to me? Oh yeah, cat, right? Yeah, someone just put it yeah, in chat. cat, that's right, all right. Uh, and Jesse, if you wouldn't mind, give, give me just uh, one, one term from finance, one term. Um, profitability. Great, I, now in this other, uh, in this other uh, tokenizer, seven is profitability. And the model learns only on the numbers. And so mm -hmm. if you mix and match, you may have meant cat, but the model thinks that you meant profitability. So no, you can't mix and match tokenizers. That means in your code, you have to be really careful that these tokenizers work with this transformers. And there are dozens of different types of transformers and pre-trained models that you have to keep track of as well. And you have to load them in a particular way. And the, a lot to keep track of. And so instead, instead what we do uh, is we try not to keep track of everything. There's no one person that can keep track of all the different kinds of and types of tokenizers, all the different types and kinds of transformers, all the different data sets. These are all things you need to have labeled and ideally uh, noted so you can know what the strengths and weaknesses of each of these are, where they came from, the provenance. You need all that stuff. That's Hugging Face. So Hugging Face gives you a repository for data, tokenizers, associated models, and now pipelines. 
that allow you to simplify the interaction of all these things. So let's go and take a look uh, at, uh, uh, at, at Hugging Face uh, a, a bit here. So let's do a, um, I'm gonna take a look at a, at a quick tour first. So, and actually here, I, I think I'll start just at the, the main Hugging Face. Uh, uh, so you'll notice it mentions the models and the data sets. It also has pricing. It's actually, everything is, is uh, open source, but we'll talk about what they would be charging for. It turns out it's a very handy uh, uh, service that they offer. But the whole idea is that this is a central repository for all things transformer. All the models, all the tokenizers, the data sets that are important, all of that is made easily available here. To make all these things work together, so in order to carry out uh, this work, where did my, okay, one moment. In order to carry out this work, pull this out here, in order to actually do this, this pipeline of work, they introduce pipelines. And what pipelines do for you is to handle everything for you having to do with loading an appropriate data set, with loading the appropriate tokenizer, loading the appropriate model, and then doing whatever else you need to have done. They're called a pipeline and they handle all that for you automatically. Think about one of the uses that we talked about early on, which is um, we had that text about Amazon forest, Amazon rainforest. And all we did was we gave it text for it to work on. In that case, you're just, you need to tokenize that text. Go back to here. So let's think through the, uh, the rainforest example. If I want to, if I have a particular model that I want to answer a question from text that I've given it, I've got to take the text that I've gotten. I need to tokenize it. I need to pull up the appropriate transformer model. And then I need to output the, its prediction. And what, trans, what, what pipelines allow you to do is to simplify how that works. So they have a question answering. So you provide the model with some context that paragraph on, on Amazon, and a question, how many miles are covered in the basin? And then it produces an answer and a confidence for that. Uh, let's say that instead what I wanted to do was uh, some sentiment analysis. Is what I've written positive or negative sentiment? So simple, simple thing here. In a pipeline, all I need to do is, first of all, in Python, I need to say this. Anybody remember who? Uh, especially someone who was in the workshop uh, last week and who's relatively new to Python. What does it mean? What do I mean when I say from transformers import pipeline? Yep, we're importing modules. We're importing modules. Pipeline is a library. And so it is importing uh, just part of it. Uh, oh, and I didn't see the question. Peter, what about computer vision tasks? Does hugging face, of, hugging face have a pipeline automation for this? Yes, it does. It's not one of the features one hears, but it does exist uh, for images, absolutely. All right, so we have a classifier. It's defined as this pipeline. So essentially what's happening here is that it is encoding all of this work. So it's turning into a single command, take this data, tokenize it, run the appropriate transformer on it, and then output the results. Let's see what it looks like to actually run this. Classifier, we are very happy to show you the Hugging Face Transformers library. That's it, single command. So it takes something which is pages and pages of code, turns into a single command. Um, how do you suppose it knows what model to use when I say pipeline? Because it can do all these different things and all of a sudden it was pipeline. How does it know which model 
is the best one to use. What command did I give it that told it what task I was going to be doing? Where is that in the code? It's give you a hint. Exactly. It's that classifier is equal to is defined as a pipeline sentiment analysis. So when I said sentiment analysis, that let it know the task that I wanted to do. And it has a default transformer model and the associated default encoder uh, that works with that. So it chose one. And do you suppose that I could change which model it's using with the parameter? Yeah, exactly. I could change it or I could go with the default. This is the hallmark of a really nice pipeline solution, where if you don't tell it anything, then it chooses the one which is most appropriate for your data and whichever one is considered best by the pipeline author. You can change it if you want to, but if you don't have a dog in the fight and you say, I just want to do sentiment analysis, it's going to make a pretty good choice for you. So you can change things pretty low level, but it's going to make a pretty good choice for you to make your coding as simple as possible. So it chose one, and you can actually read the documentation and figure out which one it chose. Can somebody tell me what the object is that it returns? What is that thing? It's a dictionary. This is why we spent time on dictionaries before. It returns a dictionary, which is a mighty handy way to return structured feedback that can vary depending on the type of pipeline that you are that you're calling up. Um, Jesse asked, is it just a default or is it doing some kind of auto detecting? The answer is yes. Some are defaults and some is, some are doing auto detecting. Excellent. So it is a dictionary. Yeah, it looks rather like JSON, doesn't it? Okay. <clears throat> So this is the heart of the, uh, of the transformer pipeline. And this is the heart of what makes it uh, a much, much simpler uh, to, to use. So let's take a look at the capabilities of, of some of these. Here's a summary of, uh, of the tasks. Um, so here, I'm gonna, I'll put this in the uh, chat. Here's a summary of tasks to give you just a, a, a really nice closer look at um, uh, at a particular uh, task and all the different things that you can do uh, with it. So, and this one does sequence classification. Uh, here's another one that does extractive question answering, shows you actually how to run it. So pipeline question answering, then you give it the question you give the context and then you ask it the question. Uh, we have language modeling, mass language modeling. We have causal language modeling. You remember in causal language modeling, much like the, the quote from Zora Neale Hurston, we masked that very last word. And so those tend to be really good at generating text, which is exactly what these uh, can do here. Uh, the text generation, it can do text generation. It can do named entity recognition. The basics are doing uh, person, uh, place, uh, organization, and there's one other, but you can easily do additional training on this to do more. Uh, some other things that it's, that is, it can do summarization. So given a long text, generate a short summary of what's happening. And it can do translation. So these are all the ones that are mentioned in the specific uh, task summary. But it can do more than this. These are the ones that can do images as well. But these are the ones that are that are that are described here. I'd like to do a breakout session to think about application of pipelines. 
So uh, in your, uh, 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 there's a document here, I'll put a, a link to it here, breakout room discussions, it looks like most of you are here, uh, but we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll share this with, uh, let's see, oops, her. and actually, uh, Preston, if you could put the link to the breakout room discussions in the, um, uh, in the chat, that would be great. I'm going to go and create just randomly selected breakout rooms. Let's go and take about five minutes to do. Um, uh, let's take five minutes to uh, answer the questions there. And let me set this for five minutes. I'm going to automatically move new, but you can return to this room at any time. And what we want to do in this first part is we would like to um, describe some of the applications of the pipeline. So this can be a possible application. So for your particular project, which pipeline is closest, um, you know, figure out which pipeline you would use, or you can come up with another example of a project you or an idea that you might have. Um, so if you have a project, provide an answer relative to your project, if you would, in addition to whatever else you want to do. Otherwise, you can just create an example. I'm going to assign people to move to, into rooms. Any questions before we go into the breakout rooms? All right. Reminder, do choose somebody to share their screen uh, to be a note taker, if you would, and to be ready to sort of to speak to some of these. I'll choose just a couple of rooms at random. Be sure to write down what you're thinking. I'm going to open the rooms, and we'll see you all in five minutes. How are you doing, Preston? I'm doing pretty good. I'm just working on a task. Uh, Dr. Bell asked me to find a bunch of small images of animals. So I'm All right. working on that right now. Excellent. Welcome back, everyone. Mm -hmm. Quick check. Uh, how Was five minutes OK for that, or was it too short? Thumbs up if five minutes was OK. Ooh, thumbs down if you wanted a little bit more time. I will keep that in mind. Okay, <laughs> good to know. The worst thing when it's, is when it's way too long. That's mm -hmm. I mean, like torture for, for introverts, such as myself. I'm actually very much of an introvert. And so <laughs> I, I just, I, I hope and pray when, it, when I'm in a room that's lasting a long time that there's some good extroverts in there because otherwise I'm gonna have to go away. All right, so we have some really interesting uh, responses here. So let's go ahead and, um, go through some of the rooms. Um, uh, so room three, who can speak to room three and, uh, and the tasks that you'd be using for that? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll start with the task and Pedro can jump in because it was his suggestion for how to maybe take it on is we, um, we've got a, a bunch of novels um, the, written during roughly the same period of time, all of which are concerned with aging and mortality, the sort of usual novel things. But the question of does that concern shift in terms of how it picks up on youthness or ageness, to coin some ugly words on the fly, um, as the authors get older. So we know when the novels are written, we know how old the authors are when they're written. So that would be a way of rounding it and then kill pipeline. Um, I'll, I'll pass to, to, to Pedro. Yeah, so, so briefly we're uh, discussing potentially a classification task where we classify the novels by the time they were written and then exploring essentially the weights to see whether those features relate to this hypothesis that you know what exactly about aging it is that uh, determines or the way that they speak about aging determines the age or the time in which the novel was written. Oh, that's nice. That is great. And uh, let me, uh, so you, you, you mentioned the weights and, and tell me if this is what you were, were thinking of. Um, 
Were you thinking of using these hidden states directly? Uh, yes. So those those would be the yep. This is that's a really nice approach. So for many of the tasks for which there isn't a pipeline that's exactly right, sometimes the answer is you yourself use those hidden states because what's happened is you've translated all that text into a, a conceptual representation. So if your question is more about how do the representations, how do the concepts shift over time, things along those lines, you can actually directly assess those hidden states. So it's a fascinating a, a, a approach uh, that uh, I just want to make sure that you all, all think about. You don't have to have some classification model sitting there. You don't have to have some additional uh, uh, decoders hitting here, you know, creating you know new text for you. You can you can use those directly as well. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, uh, let's see. Let me ask uh, another room uh, to share theirs. Uh, uh, room four, uh, extractive uh, question answering. Danny, it was sound like, sounds like this, this, this was yours. Yeah, so um, although I think the more interesting one is we we're having trouble figuring out kind of some of the image classifications. Mm -hmm. um, but for my project, we're, I'm, um, what I'm doing is pulling out scientific articles and newspaper articles that are making historical comparisons to um, during the time of COVID to previous epidemics and pandemics. So polio, smallpox, et cetera. So a, a more simple part of this is figuring out exactly which of the previous um, epidemics are being compared to and the, um, the question and our uh, extractive questioning answering seems to be at least part of the um, solution there. Excellent. Also, perhaps another one in sort of the second phase for that, maybe going directly after the, the, uh, uh, the that, that concept is those, uh, uh, that, that hidden states uh, as well. Excellent. Yes. All right. Um, let's see. Room seven. Uh, what is your thinking here? Uh, there's a paper in the BMD by Anu Pam Jenna that says that uh, surgeons perform 23% worse in terms of negative outcomes uh, for surgeries performed on their birthdays. So the idea is like if we can use sentiment analysis on their Twitter to see like whether strong, strong positive or negative emotions has any effect on uh, the performance, that might be a really good research there. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Uh, Peter, can I call on you? Because I know that you're you're also very much interested in, in images. Uh, what, what did you uh, uh, come up with? We first started talking about my task. We, we moved to a different task, mm -hmm. and we, we, we elaborated more on that. OK. Uh, yes, and, and my group writer, uh, I think, could talk more to it. Sure. So for uh, which room were you in? I'm sorry. I want to say it was eight. I could be mistaken. <laughs> so room eight, who's who's the who's the speaker for the eight? Yeah. Hey. Um, so we talked we talked a little bit again about Peter's task at the beginning of using the image classification pipeline to uh, for detecting lung cancer. Um, we didn't get really into that because I think someone else mentioned in one of the other groups above. It's like diving a little bit deeper into like how that needs to be modified to you know fit a more specific task like that. Um, but then we started talking a little bit about using language processing to look at news articles and which of these applications might be useful uh, in kind of that domain. Uh, something that was suggested was like summarization because you know uh, there's a lot of push about writing articles by trying to summarize other sources and stuff like that. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, Pedro, you said we had a question on our group regarding pre-processing of pipelines. How much pre-processing pre is necessary plugging, before plugging data into a pipeline? You know what's kind of interesting is that for images, there's less because it's already numerical data. The challenge more is when it's text, when it needs to be translated, you need that dictionary lookup, right? You need to actually create that encoding first, that tokenization, uh, before you do anything. So it's, it's very Pythonic, right? Tokenization. So you actually need to to take the word or the subword 
and then translate it into some token, in this case, an integer that can be understood uh, by, the, by the network. If you're dealing with other things that are already inherently numerical, you're actually kind of already there. Audio, same thing. It's already numerical. And so it can learn off of it uh, uh, already. Great. Let me ask you, are there any, uh, any tasks that simply did not seem to fit uh, at all with any of these? Once you open up the idea that you can inspect those hidden states directly, then things become much more possible. All right, let's go and talk a little bit more in depth about, uh, about uh, transformer models. I'd like to share just a little bit more uh, about what's happening underneath the hood so you can get a good understanding, uh, correct understanding. Again, this is not, you know, uh, enough to, uh, this is enough to understand, and then you can dive deeper, but here's the sort of the most important things to know. Oh, I hate it when it starts at the beginning. All right. Okay. So recall, a couple of things have to happen. One, you have to take these, the, you have to do tokenization. So how does tokenization happen? It turns out, uh, okay, so we need to tokenize, that's one thing. The other thing is I wanna talk a little bit more about attention uh, and what that means and how that works and why it's important. So tokenization, the first thing is you usually don't just tokenize whole words. Think about if you needed to limit your dictionary, you can maybe do a thousand, but because you remember, you remember how we, we talked about before what, how the encoding happens. You get a vector that is as wide as your token lookup table, your token dictionary. Because remember how we showed that cat was going to be an element in that in that in that span of words that we'd seen. We have a vector that is as long as the number of tokens that you have. So number seven, cat. If there's a one there, then that means that cat appeared somewhere in the string of words. So that means that encoding vector needs to be as long as your, uh, uh, your, your, your dictionary. How well do you think it would work to have a solution where you were limited to 100 words? Okay, and here's something funny, and I, should, I absolutely need to put a slide in here because it just, just occurred to me. How many people have read Randall Munro's uh, book where he describes very complex concepts using only the 100 most common words? Yeah, so Sam, do you remember what the Saturn V rocket was called? It, it was something like the it was like boom and go and up and you know. Upper goer, yeah, it was five upper goer. Yeah. Right, it's really hard. These descriptions using only 100 most common words are just, you know, you can figure it out, but it's really tough. So tokenizing at the word level is not a good idea because you're gonna have this very limited vocabulary and you'll miss all the subtlety because, oh, if your word is, is more complex than the top 100, it doesn't appear. So what do you do? What most, most tokenizers do is they do a subword encoding, and then they also capture pairings of encodings as well. So it's not down to the level of the letter. You still get some of the structure, but it's still subword. Um, just want you to be aware of this because it's, it's, it's so important. And you can use different types of approaches for, you know, you can use byte pair encoding, word piece, unigram, sentence piece. These are all different types of doing of, of encodings. They all are kind of similar in that they do a simple tokenization at the very top level, sometimes at the word level, just to get started. They count everything. They then split into sub words. Then they figure out the pairing based on the, the previous tokenization they did. Then they do some merging. If these two tokens always only occur together, they go ahead and they merge those tokens because they are always together uh, and they stop 
when they've reached the max size for the dictionary. So you capture as much as you can in that thousand. And it turns out you can represent a lot more than a thousand words because you're, you're actually capturing the, the building blocks. Yes, if you did all lowercase, you could do it in 26, but you wanna get the structure in there too. So you go wider than that and you do word chunks. Uh, but that's kind of how they work. Question about subword tokenization. Is encoding vector just determining whether a token appears or is it counting instances? Uh, both. Um, I think you can find models where, where both is done. Um, but for BERT, for example, I don't know. I don't remember. Good question. Other questions? Yes, Joe, Joseph, up goer five, that's what it was. All right. So let's talk. So that's tokenization. And this is why it's important to match your tokenizer to your model and why you might need to do extra work. If your word cannot be represented in the tokenization, then you either need to go to a different tokenization and model or you might need to do retraining of your tokenizer and of the model if your word cannot be represented. And so remember before we said it's trained on modern day words. So if you have an ancient word that just isn't there, keep in mind, it may not be representable. And that's gonna be an important thing you're gonna have in mind. It is in all English. There are now tokenizers and models for hundreds of different languages. Jesse, did you have a question? Okay, great. Let's talk about, uh, so now we've talked about token encodings and how those generally, how those work. Now let's talk about uh, attention. So um, one of the challenges that NLP faces is the speech is not always straightforward. Sometimes, People drone on and on and talking about this and that, and um, including filler that uh, is not important. But we're able to get the point because we attend to only the important parts of what is said or written. Can somebody summarize what I just said? Just top level. We can selectively attend to the important parts of a person's speech. Great. We filter out unimportant things when listening to people, yes, or reading. Humans are able to focus on the main points, automatically summarize. What, what allows us to do that? What is, what is, it's not that we have perfect memory, eidetic memory, photographic memory actually does not exist. It's not that we have that. Instead, what is the mechanism that we use? Context awareness, yes. What's another word we could use for that? I'll give you a hint. It is the only word on a white background on your screen. Yes, attention. We attend to those parts that are important. So let's go ahead and see what, uh, what you all picked up. Uh, you all were very good at picking up on the fact that uh, uh, you got to this part right here. We're able to get to the point because we attend to the important parts. So you filtered out everything by using attention and got to this part by using attention. This is precisely what sets transformer models apart. It uses attention. So rather than, remember the RNNs, the recurrent neural networks that we talked at the, at the very beginning of the, the first hour, the problem with those was that they were, they could only handle 
signals or language in a single line. Everything had to be in order and you had to process everything. So stuff like this would drive RNNs crazy. They just couldn't do it. It was all the filler. They had to memorize and know that uh is when we know that it's filler. Transformer models use attention to submit the entire text all at once, figure out which elements were there, and to put extra weight on those elements which it believes to be most important. How does it know what is most important? Context and experience. So you, those are what drive the attention. So the weights that go forward are not just what was there, but also the appropriate weights that go with each of those as well. And there are multiple kinds of attention acting at one time. It's called multi-headed attention. And you're able to do that in parallel, which is why transformer models are still trainable, even though you might think it's an inherently linear kind of process. Excellent. Questions about attention. All right, let's dive deeper. One way to use models. So a, a lot of the things that we talked about before, we were using models that were completely frozen, right? The pipelines will sometimes give you, will often give you, one-shot solutions. Hey, it's going to do sentiment analysis based on these pre-trained sentiments. And all you got to do is just submit that information to it, and then it's going to do the rest. In that case, uh, uh, what we're doing is um, uh, we're simply using the frozen model as is. And actually, in, in a lot of the cases, we're using the entire thing as frozen. The BERT model parameters are frozen and the trainable part is sort of frozen as well. That's the one shot where you don't have to do anything. One thing that you can do is you can train this last part. So let's say, for example, you want to do categorization, but you want to give it some additional training on the categorization. You can take whatever model is right here and train it more. So this is a traditional machine learning task. This could be random forest, gradient boosting, whatever you want this to be, it's using as its input these uh, actual features. And all that BERT is doing is taking your text, your images, or your sound, encoding them, and coming up with a final feature list to be used by this regular old uh, um, machine learning algorithm. So this is appropriate. Oh, yes, Peter. And you can speak it out loud if you want to ask. Uh, Peter, did you have a, a question? Is this transfer learning? Yeah, OK. In a way, this is, right? Um, this entire model, the, the BERT model, and there are many types of models. There's BERT, there's Alberta, there's Roberta. There, you know, there are many types of models. Um, in, in a sense, it's it, it's a form of transfer learning, more broadly defined, where you're using all of this pre-learned language model to give you those features, and then you can use use it to solve another task. Absolutely. Let me ask you all this. Can you think of a problem that you might have where this would not work? It doesn't work to keep BERT or your transformer model, whatever your transformer model is, frozen. Let me ask you this. I want to do an analysis of ancient, oh, there we go, Pedro. When your data are very different from the one that was modeled and trained on, fantastic. That's the core of it, absolutely. So <clears throat> if I have an, a model trained on English, modern English, and I want to do some work on uh, 
the original text of the Decameron, I, something, it's not going to work very well because it's old English. So in that case, I need to do some additional training. I might need to unfreeze BERT, redo maybe even the encoding, uh, the tagging, uh, the tokenizer, and do some additional training. Or maybe there's a concept which just wasn't learned. So it may not be the low level word, but it may be a high level concept because I'm doing uh, analysis on philosophical texts. And there's a particular philosopher and, and area of writing that I want to do work on or style of writing. And it just didn't get a whole lot of training on that. So I might want to give it more exposure to that. And so I wanted to those later layers to learn. And so this feature representation that I get are richer for my particular area. In that case, then we do something that's called fine tuning. And what happens here is, you know, before what we were doing was we were doing the training here. Oh, the answer isn't very good. I'm going to go back to my gradient boosting or neural net, doesn't matter. But I'm only going to go back far as here. And then I'm going to go forward. These representations don't change. My features don't change. In this case, what's happening is, oh, the prediction was no good. I'm going to go back to this. And I'm going to say, hey, these representations were no good. Please fix, adjust weights. Please just, please fix, adjust weights. Please fix, change tokenizer. So this is, this is error correction that goes all the way back. Just a question for you. Why not do this all the time? Because it's, it's true that the solution that you're going to get out of doing this is going to be better than the one where you just go with the frozen. Why would you ever do just frozen rather than going all the way back? There we go. Efficiency, time. Overfitting could be, actually turns out with large language models that it, it, uh, you're usually safe from that. Training is hard and really expensive. So training is hard and is really expensive. There are a couple of options for it. One is, um, oh yeah, so, and Peter, you're not going back and erasing everything, but you're adjusting. So you're sort of taking as a starting point what it's learned, and then you're sort of adjusting from there. So you're not, luckily you're not having to start over from, from scratch. So a couple of options. One is if the model isn't too big, and there are some models that are smaller than others that are meant to be more efficient, you might be able to do this on your own very good local GPU. Or you might be able to do it on a larger server. Or you can actually pay Hugging Face, and they will do this training for you. And that's what that pricing is. They will take your data set, and they will do additional training on a model so you can create a new pre-trained model that is the old English version or is the philosophy version or the legal BERT, which exists. A lot of the models that you see in Hugging Face are pre-trained versions of models that um, have been additionally trained, have been fine-tuned on specific corpuses to answer specific types of questions. So we are uh, pretty much at the end, but let's go ahead. Um, actually, no, we'll, we'll start out tomorrow, uh, Dr. Bell, if that's all right. We'll start out tomorrow with, a, with a, a, a breakout room. What I'd like for you to think about between now and then is for your particular task, do you think that you can do well with feature extraction only or whether you might need to do fine tuning? So think about that tonight. Go back and revisit what you talked about in the breakout rooms with respect to the project that you have in mind. And uh, we'll begin our discussion again tomorrow. So let's finish up questions that you have. What questions do you have about any topics that we've covered today? Well, I have a question, Jesse. So yes. how, I know I, I, I totally get the idea that uh, the differences in the data are what might might cause you to have to go back and retrain. 
but like how big are the dif- how big the differences need to be like how how and how do you know when you need to do one versus the other like so i'm thinking about like my you know my example for instance like looking at finance or like the the legal example that you gave right so yes. like do you need how far back do you need to go for and and how would you even know like how would you know oh it's not working here i need to go farther back is it just trial and error you know what's funny is a data scientist a- cannot answer that question however you as a business owner can. Can you ascribe a numeric value, like a dollar value to the model that, you cre- that you're gonna be creating? Can you just sort of give an estimate of the value? You, you can, right? I probably, yeah. Yeah, probably, right, yeah. So go ahead and run the numbers. How well is your model working? What's it worth? Okay. Then you can actually even submit to Hugging Face and you can say, they give you an estimate of how much it would cost. How much would it cost for you to train on this? And they give you an estimate of how much it would cost. And you can say, hmm, it's going to take me 10 years to recoup that training cost. Right. Right. And then you say, I'm good with how it is right now. And that's often, that's why in our, in our, and that's true for any kind of project, actually, if you can come up with a dollar amount or a value, some metric that's not a UC or sensitivity specificity, but real dollar or real value in some way, then you can make those judgments about, is it worth to continue work? Is it worth to try to do fine tuning versus just feature extraction? But you have to get to the value of what it is for you to determine. Okay. Yeah. Excellent question. Other questions? All right, we're gonna finish up folks. See you all tomorrow.